Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Gilbert Host. Today, our broadcast is entitled Advocacy and Parkinson's Disease, and we will be addressing a number of issues vital to the Parkinson's community about how we engage with our lawmakers about issues that are important to us. Now, these issues range from research funding to drug pricing, regulation of environmental toxins, and many others. I'm very excited to introduce today's guest who will help us navigate these important topics and answer your questions. And that is Ted Thompson. Ted Thompson, JD, is the Senior Vice President of Public Policy for the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research. Ted has more than 30 years of experience in public policy and government affairs, serving in several nonprofit leadership positions, as well as staff to two members of Congress. In his role at the Michael J. Fox Foundation, Ted coordinates the Unified Parkinson's Advocacy Council, or UPAC. This is a group consisting of many national and local Parkinson's disease nonprofit organizations, including APDA, which work together to address policy issues. Recently, Ted spearheaded a remarkable new PD advocacy initiative, the National Plan to End Parkinson's Act, which is bipartisan legislation making its way through both houses of Congress now that will, if passed, unite the federal government and all of those impacted by Parkinson's disease in a mission to prevent and cure Parkinson's. Prior to joining Michael J. Fox Foundation, Ted served as president and CEO of the Parkinson's Action Network, or PAN, a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit focused on federal policy issues affecting people with Parkinson's disease. Ted holds a bachelor's degree in business administration and political science from the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, and a law degree from the William Mitchell College of Law in St. Paul, Minnesota. Thank you, Ted, for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Rebecca. It's great to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and with your audience. Fantastic. Now, I know our audience is very eager to hear what you have to say and to ask their questions, but first, we would love if you could kick it off with a brief presentation. Happy to. Um, yeah, just thought it would be helpful as a bit of a place setter to, to go over a, a few topics um, before we get to the Q&A. Um, but, you know, the first question, of course, why would the Parkinson's community be involved in public policy? Well, the simple reason is uh, government, state, local and federal um, all play a role in how people live their lives with the disease, uh, not just the patient, but caregivers, uh, researchers, etc. And of course, the biggest funder, the biggest public funder of Parkinson's disease research is the uh, National Institutes of Health. So those are a couple of obvious reasons why. Um, but as we do advocate, you know, we have uh, worked to build out a network of advocates, including, as Rebecca mentioned, uh, UPAC, which I think we've got about 30 different Parkinson's and Parkinsonisms organizations that are part of that effort. It's a way for us to speak with one voice and to really um, try to uh, broaden the message as, as wide as possible. Uh, in terms of the, uh, po the policy tenets uh, or the two pillars of policy that we focus on are uh, anything related to research. So that would work to accelerate research toward better treatments and a cure. Um, that of course would include research funding, but things like research freedom to make sure that our researchers don't have artificial uh, restraints put on them for uh, for what they research. Um, uh, and then another area is that Rebecca mentioned is um, from a prevention standpoint, uh, the research that has gone in to make determinations of the connection between uh, Parkinson's and paraquat, trichloroethylene, heavy metals, and other uh, items in the environment that trigger the disease um, that's become an increasingly important and major area of public policy for us. We also, the other half is the, what good is research if the patients don't have access to whatever drugs or devices, you know, get, get approved. So uh, support for people and families living with Parkinson's um, on the entire access to care paradigm. You know, so that would be uh, most people with Parkinson's are on Medicare. So that's our major focus. Uh, but things like affordability of, of medications, um, long-term care, palliative care, you know, we are, are uh, ex we've expanded our efforts around access to care to be broader than just, you know, the uh, actual seeing the doctor and, and things like that. 
Uh, I also thought it'd be helpful to give you a sense of some policy progress and wins that um, have been happening of late. Uh, because we've been very active this year. It's been a, a, quite a huge year, actually. Um, uh, the federal research funding is an important uh, piece of, of the research pie. And at the Department of Defense, uh, it looks like we're going to get another $16 million there for um, that Parkinson-specific program. Uh, there are two new programs that Congress actually enacted last year. Uh, one is a toxic exposure research program, which ties into the toxins, obviously, that can be a trigger for Parkinson's, uh, and that's funded at $30 million. And then a traumatic brain injury and neuro neurodegenerative disease uh, fund of $65 million. So actually, in the last year, we've seen an increase of $95 million available for Parkinson's research. That doesn't mean it all goes to Parkinson's, so I don't want to mislead, but uh, TBI and toxic exposures are both um, uh, elements of uh, uh, elements of uh, environmental triggers. Another major focus is uh, for our military veterans. About 11% of all people with Parkinson's served in the military. And about 20 years ago, there was a um, uh, congressionally mandated creation of the Parkinson's Research Education and Clinical Centers within the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, which is terrific. Uh, since it was established, veterans with PD have increased by about 37%. The budget for the Podrex has increased by about 10%. So we've made a major focus on trying to get the resources necessary to provide the level of care re actually required by law, but they haven't been funding it properly. And so right now in the Senate, we've been able to secure a 50% increase in their operating budget. Uh, the whole budgeting process is not complete. We don't know when it's going to be done. We're hopeful to keep that major increase in the bill. Um, but as you know, there was just an election and um, Congress has to finish its work uh, now that the election's over. So we're going to be pushing hard to keep that increase in for the, the VA. Uh, we've had some other uh, policy wins as well. Um, we uh, worked very hard to expand access to care under the uh, Medicare Part D program. Um, we know that we can't really address the price of medications, but we'll, what we can do is have an impact on the affordability of medications. So we've been pushing um, for several years now to put a cap on how much Parkinson's patients have to pay out of pocket for their prescription drugs. And this year we got a significant victory by having an annual cap of two thousand um, dollars and the ability to spread that out over a, a year's time so that amounts to about 167 dollars per month is what a, um, a patient uh, would have to pay under medicare part d so that those were two really significant victories uh, toward the affordability uh, research freedom one of the other areas of research freedom is researching cannabis uh, that has never been really allowed in this country. Technically it has, but the government has put up so many barriers that it's been a virtual impossibility. Well, just yesterday, breaking news, the U.S. Senate passed the Medical Marijuana and Cannabinoidal Research Expansion Act. Um, the slide didn't get updated, obviously, because it happened uh, late yesterday. Uh, so that bill had already passed the House. It, passes a, it passed the Senate yesterday. It now goes to President Biden. And this will finally enable researchers to have full access to, uh, to cannabis and full ability to finally do the research. We know it's not a cure, but we, know, but we do have a lot of evidence that it can help with symptoms. And so our position on this has always been, let's find out if it does, why it does, how it does, what the delivery mechanism should be. But we've never been able to ask those questions or get answers because of federal law. So this is a major step forward toward really finding out once and for all what the benefits of cannabis could be. Another area that we recently expanded into is around state Parkinson's disease registries. Um, we know that data is like the most important thing for researchers, but what we've never had is population uh, population wide data on people with Parkinson's. So over the years, uh, registries were enacted in, in Nebraska and California, but we made it. We started a state government relations program and made a real push this year uh, to enact additional registries, uh, and we were successful. Uh, we got we have new registries uh, being created in West Virginia, South Carolina, and Maryland. 
Um, we also got a report out of Massachusetts on what it would take to create a registry. So we're going to be making a push there. Um, and we've got several other states that are targets. And in fact, if you're interested in learning more about this, um, our state team is having a, a, a coffee talk uh, in about a week, and I'll post some information in the in the chat about that. Uh, it's going to be pretty informal. We've big state team of two people right now, um, but they've got big plans and are really looking to engage advocates around the country. Uh, and, and I should say that's one of the areas that APDA and UPAC is very helpful is identifying people that are interested in uh, doing work at the state level as well. The uh, final major um, uh, topic that I want to talk to you about is the National Plan to End Parkinson's Act. It is um, actually the biggest, boldest, most comprehensive piece of legislation ever introduced in the U.S. House and Senate specific to Parkinson's disease. Um, this uh, national plan is modeled after the very successful Alzheimer's national plan from about 10 years ago. Um, and so th th what this bill does is it essentially creates an advisory council that will do a top to bottom look of fed uh, with federal uh, agencies that touch Parkinson's, along with groups like APDA and the Michael J. Fox Foundation, uh, as well as uh, caregivers, uh, people with Parkinson's, uh, specifically also a young onset Parkinson's representative, researchers, clinicians, basically the whole gamut of people that are involved in researching and caring for people with PD. And the goal of this advisory council is, um, or the requirement under the act, if we get it passed, would be to create a report to Congress. So the advisory council would submit a report to Congress um, touching on all things related to care and research, as would the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Uh, one specific element in the legislation is that the advisory council and the secretary need to identify or estimate what level of federal research funding would be necessary to actually uh, have additional breakthroughs uh, and potential cures. Uh, that uh, is, to, to a lot of us, that's a really important piece of the bill <laughs> because we pretty firmly believe that the federal investment is very low right now. Uh, on average, or for 2021, the federal investment in Parkinson's research was $270 million. That's M, million with an M. But the cost of caring for people with Parkinson's is $52 billion a year. And of that 52 billion, about half of that 26 billion is spent by the federal government. So they're spending 26 billion a year to provide care to people with Parkinson's and they're only spending 270 million a year. So we wanna, we wanna fix that. And we think that um, it's, it's long past time. PD is the uh, second largest neurodegenerative disease in the world and it's the fastest growing, expected to double in the next 15 or 20 years. And the economic burden is expected to rise to nearly um, $80 billion by 2037, which really isn't that far from now. Um, finally, I wanted to just touch on what you can do, um, because what we do in the public policy office at the state or federal level, uh, we can't really succeed if we don't have an army of advocates out there in the country uh, letting their voice be heard. So, you know, one easy way is to join our Parkinson's Policy Network. Um, at michaeljfox.org backslash advocacy. Uh, through that, you will get action alerts from us for um, important issues before Congress or the state legislature. Uh, we have uh, pre-written uh, email templates uh, as part of that. Uh, and, and those are important ways to highlight what the issues are important to our community. Um, even more impactful though, is making phone calls to your elected officials meeting with your elected officials, uh, go to their website, sign up um, to get their emails so that you know when they're having a town meeting. And, you know, Parkinson's is nonpartisan. So it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat and your legislator is a Republican, sign up anyway, because you have an opportunity to go tell your story, which is really important, telling your story, what living with the disease or living with a loved one with the disease is, just get it in front of them, get it uh, on their mind. Um, Alzheimer's has been extremely successful at this, but they don't go to every meeting saying, you gotta uh, sponsor this bill or that bill. They just go and tell their story and, and tell them how important it is for the government to be you know, a bigger partner in trying to come up with the solutions. Um, 
so actually, you know, if, if attending town meetings or requ requesting a meeting with the, your legislator is important. Um, if you belong to any support groups, bring up public policy and say, hey, we need more voices and uh, we need to grow an army. And so we need everybody involved. Uh, and then, you know, let your friends and family know what the issues are for the community from a Parkinson's perspective. Um, and I already mentioned the town meeting, uh, so I'm not going to restate that. But uh, every every voice matters. And um, I will tell you uh, just one quick story with the West Virginia registry that we got enacted. It was literally one voice, somebody who's been an advocate there for um, uh, for many years, uh, but he knows the legislators very well. And uh, we had been talking about it for a time, but this year was the year. And he succeeded working with Julia from the state team in getting legislation introduced in the House and the Senate, passed through the House and the Senate and to the governor's desk within about 35 days. Now, that is unheard of to happen that quickly, but it did in West Virginia. And it was a committed advocate who had a lot of great relationships. Um, but the message was there and people cared. And we found a bunch of legislators in West Virginia that are connected, have some connection to Parkinson's. That's the other thing you'll find when you're talking to lawmakers, when you ask the question, did you have any connection to Parkinson's? Probably seven times out of 10, you're gonna get a yes, some sort of connection. So with that, um, I know that there are a lot of questions that we wanna get to, so I'm gonna stop there and um, welcome Rebecca back so that we can start our conversation. Fantastic, thank you for that very important information, lots of interesting tidbits there. Um, we are now ready to take our audience questions. And just to remind everyone that we are going to take questions specifically about public policy and advocacy, which are Ted's expertise. So let's keep our questions focused on those, those topics. Now we have a number of questions already submitted to us to start off today's discussion. So if you're participating live today and you have a question, we encourage you to ask your question now and throughout the discussion. And in order to participate in this live chat, you will have to be logged into YouTube and Facebook. And please remember, we may display your question with the name and photo that you're logged in with. So let's get started. One question that came in before, uh, as people registered what was, how can we make the general population more aware of the relationship between toxins in the environment and Parkinson's disease? That's a good question. And we need a lot more awareness because even a lot of people in the Parkinson's community have no idea that their Parkinson's might, might have been caused by a job they had, you know, working on a farm when they were a kid or, you know, working at a dry cleaning uh, uh, the store. So, it really uh, obviously t talk to everybody you know about it um, to let them know that there are environmental triggers of, of Parkinson's disease. But beyond that, you can be educating your lawmakers about it. Lawmakers don't don't know this. I mean, you know, we're doing our part right now, but it's in, at kind of the early stages. So letting your lawmakers know about it. Another great way is writing letters to the editor. Um, I don't know if you all have seen, but there is a very, very powerful investigative uh, journalism article out of The Guardian that really um, uh, unveiled the connection, between not just only the connection between Parkinson's and Paraquat, but what the manufacturer knew decades ago about that connection. So writing letters to the editor, highlighting things like that, uh, getting it on people's radar. Um, the you know It's unfortunate because the pesticide approval process in this country uh, is very different than, than the European approval process where they have to prove in Europe that the pesticide won't cause harm. And that's not the same standard here. In fact, we've got legislation to reform the system that um, would make it more like the European style, but it would immediately require the Environmental Protection Agency to re-review, I think, 75 or 80 chemicals that are in common use in the U.S. that are banned in Europe. And so that just gives you some sense of how much uh, exposure Americans have and, and frankly, how poorly regulated um, pesticides and other toxins are. Wow. 
that are very interesting facts that I did not know. Um, we have a related question, which is, um, so if there is evidence out there that a chemical can cause harm, what is the process for getting that information into the hands of lawmakers? Or is there a process or what? What's there that? is, yeah. In fact, um, the, the whole our effort to ban Paraquat, which is a joint effort uh, with UPAC, um, that started with us compiling the scientific evidence of the connection between Parkinson's uh, and Paraquat. Um, we contacted uh, the EPA. We provided comments to the EPA not once but twice because of how long they were taking and new evidence came out. So we, we went on the record with all the scientific basis for the connection uh, between uh, Paraquat and Parkinson's. In the end, the EPA reapproved Paraquat. And so in a step that we've never taken before, um, but I assured the foundation it was okay to take, we joined in a lawsuit. We are currently suing the EPA over their decision to reapprove Paraquat. And that is now working its way through the courts and EPA has now um, agreed uh, separate from the court, well, because of the court action, but they've agreed to take a fresh look at the evidence. And so we've been able to pull that trigger to get the EPA's attention on this. Uh, but there's so many other uh, uh, triggers or toxins. Uh, trichloroethylene is heavily used to clean machine parts, heavily used in, in um, dry cleaning, for example. Uh, TCE is part of Superfund sites. I believe TCE was also in the water at Camp Lejeune, where now it's a presumptive disability. If you have Parkinson's and you uh, lived on, the, on Camp Lejeune for 30 days. So there are um, a lot of different ways to try to, to influence the process. Um, but, you know, it's not just the federal government. Uh, for example, TCE has been banned in New York and Minnesota. It's still legal federally, but the states have the right to ban things like that. And so that's where getting the attention of your state lawmakers is really important. And honestly, things move so much faster at the state level. And sometimes all you need to do is get one sympathetic ear who understands what you're saying and they'll become your champion. So I think that we could see a lot more um, success at the state level in, in order to try and get some of these toxins out of the environment. Wow, great information. Um, so Patty, one of our listeners asked a question, is there a way to get that list of chemicals banned in other countries? You mentioned there was a very long list of chemicals banned in other countries that are, that are not banned here. Is, the, is that list somewhere? Uh, it's, um, I, the, I believe they're actually listed in the legislation. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head, but uh, you can send an email to policy at michaeljfox.org and uh, the person on the team responsible for that uh, will be able to get you the list. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, let's talk now a little bit about um, drug pricing. Uh, you had mentioned in your talk, we are not able to influence the drug price itself, but we can influence affordability. Can you explain why can't we have any say in the drug pricing itself? Well, and let me clarify what I was, the point I was trying to make, because that, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we don't know what goes into um, the decision making around how they set their prices. You know, we're not health economists. We're not, you know, you know, people in corporate America and all that. So in terms of our ability to like try to actually influence the price, um, you know, a lot of groups are yelling and screaming, but that's not necessarily having any impact on the price. So we took a fresh look at it and said, OK, what can we influence? The problem is the prices are too high so patients can't afford them because their co-pays, deductibles, things like that are too high. And so that's why we focus on the affordability piece. And um, because prior to this new law, uh, and it, it goes into effect, I think, uh, in 2024, um, but prior to this cap on out-of-pocket costs, this, the, it, it wasn't quite the sky's the limit, but people could have 10, 15, 20,000 or more dollars per year in out-of-pocket costs. So that was at least one step to making it more affordable. Um, and the fact that we were able to get it spread over 12 months um, is another major victory because you, you, you have certainty. You know, okay, I'm not going to have to pay any more than 2,000 years, so I have to budget for it. But the good news is you don't need that on January 1st. You only need $167 on January 1st because it's spread out over 12 months. So that 
I hope that clarifies it a bit. It's not that we're not concerned about the prices. We definitely are. Um, and there, I think there are other levers that can be pushed. But but for purposes of trying to create some immediate uh, relief for the patient, we wanted to focus on the affordability factor. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. So a question that came in during registration. So exercise equipment is not covered by Medicare, but it's a very important part of Parkinson's treatment. Is there a way to advocate to advance Medicare coverage to include things like uh, exercise equipment? Uh, that's a topic we've been we've been talking about. Um, in particular, uh, not so much around equipment, but around um, uh, boxing, because boxing is proving to be very effective at addressing things like uh, balance and gait. And uh, in fact, we have a former congressman, Jack Quinn, who um, we work with quite a bit. He's now on our board, um, but he has been able to get three health plans in the Buffalo, New York area to cover either part or all of the cost of the boxing um, sessions. And uh, the VA in Buffalo is out also doing a research uh, project to, to quantify um, the benefit of boxing. Um, and just to put kind of a really simple head on it, you know, if a plan is going to spend a thousand dollars a year to cover your boxing treatment, your boxing uh, sessions, but you don't fall just one time, you've saved the system $50,000 or some outrageous number, maybe higher. And so those plans have looked at the numbers and said, yeah, if we can prevent these people, these folks on our plan from falling, we're going to save all this money. So, you know, you hate to say you have to put an economic argument around it, but when you have one that works, we definitely do that because this is a way for health plans to save money. And so um, we're also supporting legislation uh, by Congressman Brian Higgins uh, from New York to create a benefit under, uh, under the VA for boxing. Um, we see this as a first step because uh, uh, whoever the questioner was is right. The benefits of exercise are clear and um, we should, you know, we should be doing more to encourage people to exercise. And if finances are the reason they're not, um, you know, there are ways that we can address it. But really, it does sometimes come back to the research. We've got to be able to prove the benefit because, um, you know, Federal spending is out of control and to add more spending, you know, we've got to really be able to make the case of why it's important and necessary. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, very exciting to hear that there are so many things we can do and so many ways we can influence public policy to really help people with Parkinson's. It's very, very exciting information. Um, here's another question that came in during reg registration about telemedicine. So obviously telemedicine virgin during COVID and then there was some pullback um, on ways that one can engage in telemedicine. So what is the current state of legislation regarding telemedicine and um, what is uh, what are advocacy elements to, to improving that or getting that settled? Right. Uh, yeah, the current state is that we still have a public health emergency due to COVID and it sounds like it's going to continue for a time. But that public health emergency is what really opened the floodgates to telemedicine. Uh, people couldn't go to the doctor's office, um, and so, but they needed to see their doctor. And so finally, Medicare uh, really loosened all the rules around telemedicine to give access. And, um, and so currently, all that flexibility continues to exist. And Congress passed a provision that once the public health emergency ends, uh, they, Medicare has like 100 and I think it's some weird number of days, like 151 days. Um, to come back, you know, with a with a plan to finalize it and to have assessed the efficacy of it, and so it's uh, there's no end game at this point. You know, we keep pushing Congress to make it permanent. We put and we push Medicare to do the same. We are armed with some great research around that, though, because um, uh, there's a doctor here in Northern Virginia where I live that early in the pandemic he did some research, and I don't have it in front of me, but so don't hold me to the numbers, but of the roughly thousand new patients they saw uh, during this time frame via telemedicine, over 800 of them had never actually seen a movement disorder specialist. So they've been living with a disease, but they've never been able to see a doctor who specializes in Parkinson's. And through this, they they were able to improve care based on you know better treatments, uh, you know assessing the person's you know house. That's another benefit of telemedicine is 
you can you know show the doctor your living situation and he can say well move that chair and you should put a bar up there uh, so we, we've got actual evidence that shows how beneficial it was for the Parkinson's uh, patient. Fantastic. Very good. Um, we have a question from Robert, and this um, uses in some of the information you talked about um, expanding ability to do research on marijuana. What about uh, the legislation to get marijuana on the other end in terms of marijuana dispensaries. Um, how is uh, advocacy going towards that end? Is it easier to get marijuana now uh, for uh, medical use? And are there any advocacy issues moving in that direction as well? Uh, we, have not, uh, we have not um, advocated at the state level on marijuana. We have occasionally, based on our position, done letters of support for certain bills. Uh, but we've not been engaged around trying to get uh, uh, cannabis legalized. And I'll tell you why. It's because as a research-focused organization, we want the science to back it up. Now, 20 years ago, that was maybe a liberal position. Nowadays, it's actually quite a conservative position. And so, um, but that's why we've been pushing so hard for the last few years to break the barriers down. Let us actually find out, um, you know, how it works, why it works you know, where it works in terms of what symptoms, things like that. Uh, there's just so many questions out there. And, you know, one of my concerns, one of the concerns we have, and, and I actually sit on a, 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 the board of a group called the Co uh, Council for Federal Cannabis Regulation, is that there is no regulatory structure. Every state's doing it differently, some probably better than others. But, you know, the purity of the, of the, uh, of the plant, the, the strain, the dosage, and this is really unfair to doctors like, Dr. Gilbert, because she's being asked, you know, what should I use? How much should I use? When should I use it? Well, she's no better. Well, she's probably slightly better able to advise on that than me because I'm not a doctor, but it's an unfair position to put the doctors in to, you know, because they um, don't have access to the data. Um, I should say that's, you know, another component of this bill that just passed was uh, freeing up physicians to engage in those conversations. They have been anyway, and we've always told patients if you're, you know, because some patients will say, well, I use marijuana, but I don't tell my doctor because I don't want to be judged. And, and we say, no, tell your doctor. It's not about being judged. It's about how it's going to interact with your other medications. So it's important to, you know, uh, talk to your to your doctor if you're using uh, medical cannabis. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. Um, it is literally uh, impossible to give advice without having the data. So I agree with you 100% that getting the data is is crucial and that will be able to inform uh, the dispensaries. Right now, people go to the dispensary and say, I have Parkinson's and someone hands them some combination and there's, you know, there's no way to verify whether that's gonna be a helpful thing for a patient. So really important to have the data. So thank you. And for I that. should know, uh, you know, just this is another area that we've really worked um, across organizations um, with APDA and Parkinson's Foundation, because it's a, it's a common issue for everyone. And, and on that point, um, you know, I work in the Michael J. Fox Foundation, of course, but what we are doing in the policy team is about the community. It's not about our organization or Rebecca's organization. In fact, we rely on groups like Rebecca's to tell us what matters, what are the issues you're hearing about? Um, because we're here trying to present a, what we are here presenting a united front on behalf of the entire community. It's not on behalf of any of our organizations. And so that's where, you know, input from folks, you know, that are watching this webinar uh, too, uh, we need to hear from you because uh, we need to know what the issues are that actually matter. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, you mentioned government research funding as an important uh, piece of advocacy. Um, what are the best ways to get the government to increase research funding for Parkinson's? <clears throat> well, that's a tough one. Um, I will say that since 2016, um, uh, federal research funding at the NIH for Parkinson's has gone up by almost $100 million. Um, it was at about 140 million in 2016. It's now at about 245 million. Then you add on the, uh, the Department of Defense funding, which gets us to a total investment of about 270. So it has been going up. Um, and one of the reasons it's been going up is because of the Alzheimer's fund, actually, because it's Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. 
So Parkinson's disease, dementia, Lewy body dementia, you know, those are part of that. So some of that funding increase is focused uh, exclusively on dementia. Uh, but to more directly answer the question, how do we, you know, get more funding? The way the NIH gets funded is lawmakers agree on a, on a number, and every year it's been bigger, which is good. Uh, and they send it to the NIH. They do separate out by institute, um, but the deal is basically Congress gives them the money, but Congress doesn't tell them specifically how to spend it. They're not saying, I want you to carve, you have to carve this amount out for, for you know, MS, this amount out for epilepsy. So they don't, they don't do that, with a couple of exceptions. One of the results of the Alzheimer's National Plan was that they did get a carve out budget. And so folks might know that they are getting now over a billion dollars a year for, for Alzheimer's research. Um, the other two categories are HIV AIDS and cancer. They each have their own budget and getting a bypass budget is they're called a bypass budget, um, but it's, it's a separate, it still goes to the NIH, but it's a separate pot of money that the NIH is being told you do have to spend this in this category. So part of the national plan, the result of it will hopefully be a bypass budget. And the reason I say that it, it's, it will not be easy to get by no means. Uh, and Congress doesn't like to do disease specific anything, but we believe we've got a really strong case to, to be made uh, based on uh, the numbers of people living with the disease, the fact that it's the fastest growing, um, you know, people are aging. Uh, it's, a, it's primarily a disease of aging and we're all living longer. And that's one of the reasons there are more and more people with PD. Um, and so really uh, uh, talking to your lawmakers and making the pitch that you've got to do more. NIH is not doing enough. And we've got a great relationship with them, so don't get me wrong. And they would like to do more, but you know they they have some constraints. So we're working, you know, to try and move the needle, um, working with the agency and working with Congress. Um, but this is more of a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and the national plan we see as really a catalyst to bring a much uh, deeper focus on Parkinson's. Very good. So we have a question that came in during registration about the national plan. So you mentioned that the national plan is its first step is going to be creating a body of interested uh, individuals and agencies that will create the plan to move the needle on various topics in Parkinson's disease. So I'm a person with Parkinson's disease. How do I tell you what I would like to see implemented in this national plan? What, what would I do? Well, that's a good question. Um, and we haven't really talked about that, but one of the things that we would uh, do, and we, we've done that uh, this years ago with the FDA around patient-focused drug development, uh, we had uh, conducted, it was when I was still with PAN, but we had coordinated with all the other National Parkinson's organizations, a survey asking questions about, in this case, you know, drug development. But I, I believe that we would do the same type of thing here because if you had one or two people with Parkinson's on that advisory committee, they're not going to know everything that everybody might want as part of this uh, of this plan. And so I suspect that we will be working with Rebecca and, and others to create a survey to really try to dig deep into what is it that the patients feel would be most critical coming out of this advisory committee work and their report to Congress. Uh, the plan hasn't passed yet, so there's no place to direct people um, at this point. Um, another element, and I'm not sure if this would happen, but there's some, what's called rulemaking, uh, which is uh, where agencies are charged with doing something, and if they have to write rules around it, they put the rules out for public comment, and then the public can weigh in. Uh, uh, so if that were to happen around this national plan legislation, that would be another um, ability to um, you know, to engage. And then, you know, other things like petitions, uh, for example, with Paraquat, we did a change.org petition, got over 100,000 signatures and submitted those to the EPA. Now it didn't change their mind, but it certainly showed how engaged people were. So there are a number of different levers I think we can pull to get input from the patient and caregiver community. Fantastic. So looking forward to the bill passing and then getting input from our community. So stay tuned for that. Um, interesting question, which is, can the federal government help to increase the number of movement disorder physicians in the country, maybe by giving subsidies for neurologists to get additional training? Any thoughts on that? 
Yes, this is one of the most difficult challenges. Um, and working with our friends at the American Academy of Neurology, you know, they, they struggle with it too because they, they obviously know of the shortage. Uh, yeah, yeah, I guess the answer is yes. We, we could create incentives like that. And I think the, the person touched on it, subsidies. It's, it's uh, one of the reasons there aren't enough neurologists, frankly, is the, the pay isn't that great compared to other specialties. And so if we could level the playing field a bit around pay, then people may, you know, if you're, if you're coming out with $600,000 in student loan debt and you have a chance of making $100,000 a year or $300,000 a year, you know, it kind of is an easy answer. And so getting rid of the financial disincentive to becoming a neurologist and then further a movement disorder specialist um, you know, is one lever that, that we, that could be pulled. So it's really, and I think that would be part of the national plan conversation is we've got a shortage. What can we do about it? Um, and that's part of what excites me about this national plan concept is we're talking, you know, nuts to bolts, top to bottom, everything, um, doesn't mean that everything will be acted on immediately, but it could give a great roadmap. Um, you know, other things that are being done like the Fox foundation and, and others have movement disorder specialists. Uh, fellowships. So, you know, we're training doctors to be movement disorder specialists, but, you know, that's, uh, and it's a great program and it's working, but we need, you know, hundreds, if not thousands more. Um, and so really we need a bigger scale solution to the problem. Very good. So let's hope again that uh, that gets included in our national plan. That uh, is going to be a really exciting time. Um, yeah. So we are nearing the end of our time together. And so I'd lo love to get in this final topic, which you mentioned uh, in your talk. And this, I think, is going to be our last question, unfortunately, which is, I'm a veteran. And I would very much like to get involved in the national advocacy for veterans. What are ways that, that I can do that to offer my services as a veteran? Uh, well, the most direct way would be to reach out to us by email um, uh, at, at uh, policy at michaeljfox.org, um, and then we can put you in touch with the right person on the team. Um, this is an area that, that you know I'm passionate about, and Dustin Watson, our director of uh, federal government relations, when he first joined about 18 months ago, I was briefing him on everything we're working on. And I said, we need something for veterans and gave him the rundown of the Padrex and, you know, the, the, the statistics and everything. And he put together a, um, a, a committee of veterans and non-veterans with a, uh, a peer focus on veterans issues. And that resulted in part with this proposal to increase funding at the Padrex. But I know there's a lot more that we could be doing. Um, you know, we, we have been successful around Agent Orange with the Blue Water Navy uh, veterans, um, the Camp Lejeune uh, uh, presumptive disability, uh, some things like that. But we definitely would love to build out a broader coalition of veterans. Um, and we've been engaging with some of the veterans organizations, uh, Vietnam vets in particular, were very interested uh, and engaged uh, because so many of their members are getting Parkinson's uh, because they're at the age now. Um, and so, yeah, we would love to have you reach out and get, uh, get you involved. Fantastic. So one last question came in. So let's get that one in and then and then we'll wrap up. And this is a question from Wendy. Um, you touched a little bit on uh, coverage of uh, care for, for people with Parkinson's that isn't necessarily medication related. We discussed a little about exercise and exercise classes. What about home care, nursing home care, very, very expensive care that can happen as the disease progresses? What can an, in an advocacy role we do about uh, this uh, you know, an intense amount of money that families need to need to spend. Well, all I can say is there will be more to come. And I say that because uh, Nora on our team, um, who's fairly new, but she's done a comprehensive look at, at all of those issues and is putting together kind of a work plan on where we can hopefully uh, have influence on that. Um, it is it's really important. Um, and frankly, the pandemic is what highlighted the issues, you know, long-term care, long-term care, nursing home care, et cetera. Um, so I don't have a direct answer for you other than we've got someone on the team that's been doing a deep dive. Uh, and we do want to uh, focus on that because you're right, the affordability issues, it's not just about drugs, it's about the whole 
spectrum of, of healthcare. And, you know, our goal is to try and make enable people to live their best life with the disease um, across the board. And it's not just about medications or, or devices. It's about a lot more than that. So, you know, we're, we've increasingly expanded our policy uh, portfolio to try and get to all of those things. That's very reassuring. So thank you very much uh, for those last comments. So I want to thank uh, Ted for all that incredible information. I learned a tremendous amount uh, this past broadcast. So thank you so much. I also want to thank everyone for participating in today's discussion, for submitting your questions. And if you know someone who missed today's program, who might be interested in hearing all this great information, if you join late, if you'd like to watch again, the recording will be available later today on our YouTube channel. So please come by and watch. And don't forget to subscribe to APDA's YouTube channel to watch new videos and live broadcasts. Now remember, APDA can help you connect to resources that you need, so call us at 1-800-223-2732, visit our website at apdaparkinson's.org, and you can explore all that we have to offer. I want to just highlight our next episode of Dr. Gilbert Host, which is going to take place on Wednesday, December 14th at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to be presenting a broadcast entitled Parenting and Parkinson's Disease, and we're going to introduce you to both people who are parents as well as children of people with Parkinson's, and they're all going to offer their unique perspectives with a range of experiences ready to share their stories. So please join us. Now be sure to stick around for a few final messages. And before I go, I wanna thank you and Ted again today for great information and for joining us. We hope to see you soon on another APDA program. Have a great rest of the day. I'm Leslie Chambers, the President and CEO of the American Parkinson's Disease Association. Each month across the country, APDA is providing support groups, exercise classes, and educational programs like this one to support the Parkinson's disease community. You can find all of our upcoming virtual events on our website at apdaparkinson.org events. If you enjoyed today's broadcast, I hope you will consider making a donation to help keep programs like this possible. Your gift can help APDA support people living with PD through local programs, reliable resources, and groundbreaking research designed to find treatments and ultimately the cure for Parkinson's disease. Please donate today at apdaparkinson.org slash donate. And thank you so much for your support.